significance of derivatives. Um, so yesterday we saw a bit of rule, which is a way to apply derivatives to finding limits. And I talked about, well, L'Hopital's rule tells you something about a quotient that's zero divided by zero or infinity divided by infinity and nothing else really. But the thing is, if you, if you see something else, like a difference or a product, um, if you figure out how to use algebra to turn it into a quotient, then you can attempt to use L'Hopital's rule. Um, and, and now I'm going to do the last kind of indeterminacy that you could find, which is powers. So if you have a, uh, a function to the power of another function and the limit of the base is something and the limit of the exponent is something else. Um, when, first of all, which powers are indeterminate? I'm about to ask you, so you're ready. So, um, zero, one, and infinity could give you trouble. So, I guess we're choosing among these nine. Infinity is zero. <clears throat> these are all positive infinity, otherwise, things. Might not make sense. Um, and then the exponent, you can always change it to a negative if you do one over that. So, so some of these um, are not indeterminate and some are. So the question is, which is which? And I'm going to ask you. Um, I think I, I mean, I never care what you answer. The point is that you, <clears throat> you see for yourself how you do it. So uh, I think there's there's three of them that are indeterminate. One, two. No, there's more. One, two, three, four, four, four are indeterminate. Oh, no, no, three. This is so interesting. All right, I'm gonna give you 30 more seconds. Some of them have no bolts. One of them has no bolts.
20 seconds. Three, two, one. All right, well, um, very close all together. <clears throat> I guess which three one? Zero to the zero, which is in the terminal. One to the infinity and infinity to the zero. Uh, oh, so you got it correctly. And the fourth one, which is not in the terminal, is zero to infinity. All right, great job. Um, all right, so. Democracy worked. Um, okay, so zero to the one is definitely zero. Um, I mean, taking taking the exponential is a continuous function. I guess in both variables. Uh, so if I, unless I'm taking zero to a zero, uh, all of these. All of these have a definite answer. So now, um, also, if you take uh, if you take something very large and you and you take a power of it that approaches one, it's just still going to be very large. Um, and if you take something very large and you take a very big power of it, it's just going to get larger. So you only get an indeterminacy when when things sort of contradict each other. So if you take zero to the zero, you take something uh, that's becoming very small and you take a very small power of it. Well, anything to the zero is going to be one, including zero. Zero to the zero is one. Um, but um, But anything but zero to anything is going to be zero. So that's a problem. X to the X could go to zero, but not, well, X to the X goes to one. But anything to anything could go to, if they both approach zero, it could go to zero or one. And if they can go to two places, it means it can go somewhere in between as well. So this is indeterminate. Um, Zero to the infinity. Zero to the infinity. Uh, well, you're taking a very small number, a number close to zero, and then you're taking a very large power. Uh, if you take a very large power of a small number, then you just get an even smaller number. Uh, this is just going to zero. <clears throat> Next, um, this one is indeterminate. Um, for example, one, one to anything is just one. But if you take, uh, as soon as you take something a bit bigger than one, uh, and you and you take and you take a very large power, you you can go you can go to infinity. So this one is indeterminate as well. I guess we're gonna see examples. <laughs> because uh, taking anything to a large power wants to make it very big or very, very small if it's uh, smaller than one. And, but, but if the base is one, then it wants to be one. So there's a conflict there. And finally, infinity to the zero is also indeterminate because the infinity in the base makes it wanna be very big and the zero in the exponent makes it wanna be one. So, uh, so you got it right. Congratulations. Okay. So, um, what you can always do is we can always just write a function of, we can always write an exponential, uh, as as a product involving the logarithm. Uh, for example, if you take if you take logs, you will have that the logarithm 
of f to the g equals g times the logarithm of f. And this will mean that f to the g is the exponential of g log f. So this turns um, an indeterminate power in the, in, into an indeterminate product. And then a uh, product I can turn into a fraction very easily by writing one over something in the denominator. So zero to the zero turns into the exponential of zero times the logarithm of zero, which is the exponential of zero times negative infinity. So there's the indeterminacy. One to the infinity turns into the exponential of uh, infinity times the logarithm of one, which is the exponential of infinity times zero. And finally, infinity to the zero turns into the exponential of zero times the logarithm of infinity, which is zero times infinity. So these three really come from the 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 ways that a product can be uh, indeterminate. All right, so let's do an example. Um, well, at least now we know that if we get any of the six that I didn't circle, we just know the answer straight away. Um, what do I want to do? Um, let's do. So let me look. Ooh, that's the next section. So um linear sex approaches zero. Of one plus the sine of four x to the power of the equal tangent of x. Okay, so um, one. So where is this approaching? Um, one plus the sine of zero is approaching one because sine of zero is zero. On the other hand, the cotangent of zero is the cosine of zero divided by the sine of zero. This is approaching one over zero. This is approaching um, positive infinity because if, if x approaches zero from the right, um then sine is going to approach zero from the right as well. So this is a positive number. The cotangent looks like this. Okay, so this is one to the infinity. So we're in, in one of the indeterminate situations from before. So um what I pretty much always do is we um use the logarithm to rewrite this. So this is the limit of one plus sine x to the cotangent of x. This equals uh, the exponential of the exponent times the logarithm of one plus sine x. 
You forgot the four with the sign it. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you so much to me. So what I really need to compute is the limit of the thing inside of the exponential. The limit of the cotangent times the logarithm of one plus sine of four x. And because of what I did before, this is gonna be the logarithm of zero. This is gonna be approaching negative infinity. No, logarithm of one. There's a, there's a one there. This is gonna be approaching uh, zero. This is gonna be approaching positive infinity. So I wanna use L'Hopital's rule. So I wanna turn this into a fraction. So I should send one of these things to the denominator, keeping in mind that I'm gonna to have to take derivatives um, afterwards. So we should go to the denominator, cotangent or logarithm of one plus sine of four X. I know I have my favorite to the to go to the denominator, but I don't know if you do. Well, so there's two options. So you can you can guess have a pretty good chance of getting it right. Which derivative would you rather take? One over cotangent or one over logarithm of one plus sine of four x? If you don't know which path to take in a problem, just take the easiest one to take. And then if you if it doesn't lead anywhere, you didn't lose as much. So I could go one over cotangent, all right, two votes. Uh, I agree. Um, one over cotangent is tangent. So let's just leave the, this nasty thing alone. and take the cotangent and write it in the denominator. So one over cotangent, one over cotangent is one over cosine divided by sine, which is uh, sine over cosine, uh, which is tangent. So, um, so this is logarithm of one plus sine of four X divided by the tangent of X. All right, that looks like I can, like I can do it. So now, let's copy it. Um, logarithm one sine four x divided by the tangent. So um, this is now zero divided by zero. So I can use L'Hopital's rule. Well, 
which means I can take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator rate and try again. So, uh, well, the derivative of tangents I know by heart, it's secant squared. Uh, the derivative of the logarithm of one plus sine four x, not so much. I'm gonna, there's a lot of functions inside of functions in there. So I'm gonna have to use the chain rule uh, twice. So, um, First, I have to take the derivative of logarithm respect to the inside. Then I have to take the derivative of the inside sine of 4x respect to 4x. And then I have to take the derivative of 4x respect to x. Ooh. Um, takes longer to write than to do. So the derivative of logarithm is a logarithm of anything is one over anything. The derivative of one is zero. The derivative of sine is cosine and you keep the inside the same. So I'm going to take the derivatives of the inside and plugging them in. And the derivative of four times x is the same thing as four times the derivative of x, uh, so just four. So in the end, I get four cosine four x divided by one plus sine of four x. And I think I'm done. Because this is, um, it looks complicated, but it's a continuous function. These brackets here. Um, because um, cosine of zero is one and Sine of zero is uh, zero, so this is really it's really just four. So that's it. Um, so to recap, I had. the limit as x approach zero of one plus sine. So now I'm just writing what I wrote in the previous page. So this was, um, I took the exponentials, the, I took the exponential of the logarithm, which is the same as not doing anything. And now since e to the x is continuous, it doesn't matter if I do the function and then the limit or the limit and then the function. And I just figured out that this limit is four. So the limit of this function um, is just e to the fourth. And we're done. Are there any questions? So the moral of the story is that um, to doing determinant powers, you just need to take a logarithm, turn them into indeterminate products, and then know how to do indeterminate products.
All right, I guess everyone is happy. So, um, yeah. I have a question. So, for every time to do an indeterminate power, you always put it to law up to e, like so. Pretty much. Okay. Um. So it's always going to be e to the function. E to the well, every time. E to the f of x times g of x, basically. Uh, well, with the logarithm. With the logarithm. Okay. Because this is the same as e to the logarithm of f to the g. Sorry, um, yeah, f to the g. Okay. Yeah, I can't think of any example where you wouldn't want to do this, honestly. Probably there is, but. Also, they, they generally tend to be one to the infinity, the ones you encounter. Is that a entity? Ah. Let me go kill this entity before it kills me. All right, reflect on. Um, Reflect on the determinant powers for one second. <clears throat> All right, you didn't hear me swear. Uh, okay, so uh, next chapter. So um, the next uh, chapter in the book is called 4.5. It's called Summary of Curve Sketching. And there's it's a summary for a reason. There's nothing new in it. It's just putting together everything we everything new we've learned about sketching curves into one handy list. Uh, so if you want to sketch your graph, um, this is a series of things you can try. This is not a word, increase heating. Uh, and basically, well, if you don't want to think, you can just go through all of them. What? Oh, that's just great. What did I just, why? <sighs> Chambers is great. Like, how do you do this? This program doesn't even have to be copying and pasting. Why would it do that to me? Oh, now it moves. Okay. Um, so basically all the things we've learned how to do, well, some of them you already knew. Some of them, and some of them you didn't because they involve derivatives. <sighs> oh, okay. I guess I'm not writing 4.5 there. Yeah, I'm gonna not touch this slide anymore. This is 4.5. So, um, all right, so computers grab things, but they get things wrong all the time, which is why, um, which is why you should know how, you should know how to grab things yourself just to know if a computer lied to you or not. Um, for example, in the homework problem, in the first one, the one you handed in yesterday, um, a lot of people said that the graph didn't go through zero zero, but the equation tells you it goes through zero zero. Um, and also, you know, a computer can tell you, and a computer can approximate things. It can tell you 
the maximum of the dysfunction is at 1.57, but if you but if you use algebra, you can figure out the exact point, which um, it's more convenient to know than uh, just knowing the computer approximation that you're not even sure it's there. Also, it just gives you a reign of life. So, okay. So you you have a function. Um, basically, you can go through this list. You can go in any order. Although, I mean, this order is kind of logical. You can, if a, if a step is too complicated or you don't feel like doing it, you can skip it. Um, and, and you can, I don't know if you can add anything to it. So you can figure out the domain and the intercepts that's and the symmetry. That's stuff from algebra. A symmetry, I mean, is it an even function? Is it an alpha function? Does it repeat like sine or cosine? Uh, the asymptotes is also from algebra. And then looking at the first derivative, you can see where it's increasing and decreasing. And looking at the second, you can look at its concavity. And when you do all of those together, if you figure out all of those, you can really, you can really draw a good picture. And um, yeah, there's just not much more to do that you could tell with your naked eye. Um, so let's do an example because um, nothing to this section except doing an example. <clears throat> so. Let's say, let's sketch um, the graph of 2x squared divided by x squared minus 1. OK. So um, going through the list, what's the domain of this function? Well, the, the domain is going to be everywhere where the denominator doesn't vanish. Um, and where is the denominator zero? Plus or minus one. Plus or minus one. Thank you. I didn't see your name. I'm going to guess. I'm not going to guess. I think I know who it was. x squared is 1, if only if x is plus or minus 1. So the domain is every number except plus or minus 1. Uh, all right, so now I know where, where to draw and where to not draw. Um, the intercept, this is probably the least useful thing in the, in the whole list, but anyway, um, if you remember the, well, the, the, the y intercept is, uh, convenient, um, because you just find f of zero. The y intercept is zero, f of zero. The x intercept or the x intercepts could be more than one are the points where f of x equals zero. So there you have to solve an equation, and that might just not be convenient. But, um, at least, so what's f of 0? Well, plug in 0. 2 times 0 squared divided by 0 squared minus 1. That's 0. So the function goes through the origin. So that's also an x-intercept. I wonder, are there any others? So what? Do I get if I make this equation equal to zero? Well, I don't get anything else because multiplying by the denominator, I get x squared equals to zero. So x has to be zero. 
So only the origin. I guess I can figure it out now. So I know the function goes through the origin. When x is, nah, I'm not gonna figure out. But I guess I can figure out where it's positive or negative, but it's not even worth it. <clears throat> so, um, what's next? Symmetry. So, is it is it even or odd? Um, is it periodic? Which means, uh, which means, does it repeat uh, every every interval? So, is it one of these three? Well, to see if it's even or odd, I need to plug in negative x into the function. And if I get back x, uh, if I get back the same function, that means it's even. Uh, and if I get back the opposite, that means it's odd. So what happens if I plug in negative x? I, what I see is that I only get negative x inside of a square. And negative x squared is the same thing as positive x squared. So the function is even. So that's great because it means that it has, um, Mirror symmetry around the the y axis. So if I want to, I only need to look at positive x's from now on, and I know that everything else will be reflected. Call it Jake. Good job. Everything will be reflected across the y axis. So really, um, you only need to you only need to do the um, you only need to have the work. That's why symmetry is right. It saves you at least have the work. Uh, is it periodic? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, functions are periodic when they only have sides and cosines and things like that. Uh, there's just no way this is periodic. But I mean, if if it was, I would find out later. Uh, but I mean, rational functions cannot be periodic. For example, if it was periodic, it would have a bunch of x intercepts repeating every set amount. Okay, um, so asymptotes. Oh, this is calculus. I don't know why I said this was algebra. So, um, so vertical asymptotes, despite what you might think, um, happen when the limit at a point is plus minus infinity, which might involve denominator vanishing, and it might not. Uh, so. Since, uh, well, the thing is, if this is going to happen, the limit does not exist. The function is not continuous. But the function is continuous away from uh, plus minus 1. So there can only be asymptotes at plus minus 1.
so what's the limit of the function at x equals one? And I, I only need to do one because the function is even. So have the work. So um, the limit as x approaches one of the function. So this is two divided by zero. Since this is non-zero, uh, this is going to be plus minus infinity. So there is an asymptote indeed. So it's not only that the denominator goes to zero, it's also that the numerator doesn't. So um, so now I know that there's an asymptote. I know that it goes to zero, zero. I know that at x equals one, there's an asymptote. I should probably figure out um which um on which side it, it approaches so let's do it more carefully let's do the limit on on the left and on the right so if i approach one from the left this is going to be uh, close to two this is going to be positive and what about x squared minus one what if x is smaller than 1? Is x squared minus 1 positive or negative? If I take x to be smaller than 1. Both. It's not both. So one of those doesn't. It's never zero unless I pass through one negative. If x is smaller than one, then x squared is smaller than one as well. So x squared minus one is smaller than zero. So you have a negative number, uh, positive divided by negative. That's going to be a negative number, and I know it's going to infinity. So this function is doing something like this. And I can figure out the other side the same way. The top is still positive. And the bottom, if x is bigger than 1, x squared is bigger than 1, and x squared minus 1 is going to be positive. So this is approaching positive infinity. So negative infinity is down there. Positive infinity is up there. So that's what I know about the about the graph so far. So. As always, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. So horizontal asymptotes. Can you go back real quick? Yeah. OK. All right. So uh, horizontal asymptotes, as I know by heart, um, happen when the limit at infinity is a is a constant. Again, uh, by the same reason, by the symmetry again. So uh, by the mirroring here, just that by since this is symmetric. I know there's an asymptote at negative one, and this looks like, and this looks mirrored. Here, um, I only need to do uh, to do one of them. So let's say x approaches positive infinity. So 
the limit as x approaches positive infinity of this function. Well, you can look at it and know that it's two. Uh, but since we just learned it, let's use L'Hopital's rule. This is infinity divided by infinity. So we can take derivatives on the top and bottom and try again. So this is the limit of 4x divided by 2x, which is the limit of 2. So uh, y equals 2 is uh, a vertical asymptote. Uh, horizontal. Y equals a constant is, is just always horizontal. So um, I guess we could ask if it crosses the asymptote. That's usually tends to be an equation that is easy to solve. So um, that means. So if I have y equals two and the graph, this would mean that f of x equals two. And we can just do that because it tends to be um, it tends to be doable. So if I write two x squared equals uh, divided by x squared minus 1 equals to 2. Multiplying by x squared minus 1, I have that 0 equals negative 2. So the answer is that it never crosses the asymptote. So um, that means that There's a vertical asymptote here. There's a horizontal asymptote here. The function is continuous everywhere else. So it goes through the origin. It approaches negative infinity on the positive side and the negative side. And then it approaches this asymptote. And it looks symmetrical on the other side. So just draw the mirrored version. I guess, well, I guess I'm joining the dots, but I guess I don't really know what happens in between. So uh, yeah. All right, so I'll finish this tomorrow. Um, Tomorrow, I'll see where it's increasing and decreasing, and where it's concave and convex up and down, where, where is the max and minimum points, and then we'll move on to the exciting world of opti optimization problems. Uh, the chapter where the money is. All right, that's it. Um, have a good day.